Greetings, fellow Bible students, and welcome to another Bible Truth Commentary broadcast with Dr. Matthew Mahan. We've been studying the Gospel of Mark, and we're almost finished with Mark chapter 2, where the Lord Jesus Christ has been dealing with various controversies between him and the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus has begun to become a, a very famous and very prominent person in Israel, and that has been a, um, a, a sort of a threat to the leadership. Uh, so these controversies came up. Uh, we've looked at some of them already. The controversy over healing the paralytic, um, the controversy over uh, in the last study, eating with tax collectors and sinners, <clears throat> and then over fasting. And uh, so the Lord Jesus Christ deals with these issues um, in the house of Levi uh, with three parables. And as you might remember, he's feasting in the house of Levi. Uh, he had called Levi to be one of his disciples. Levi was a tax collector, a professional person, and he immediately left his profession to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, he's the same person that wrote the Gospel of Matthew. Levi is Matthew, so he wrote the Gospel of Matthew, and of course he's recorded here in Mark. All of the Gospels dovetail, and that what, what makes them so amazing is the Bible given un, under inspiration gives us these four different viewpoints of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ and his first coming in perfect harmony one with another, yet each one different and from different perspectives. Well, these three parables that the Lord Jesus Christ gives the scribes and Pharisees, the first one is the bridegroom and fasting. They asked him, why don't, why don't your disciples fast? Uh, John's disciples used to fast. Why don't yours? And they had come up with all of these rituals and all of these additional requirements in order to virtue signal, in order to show everybody what good people they were, and in fact, better than the rest of society because they did more than what the law of Moses expected them to do and kept uh, feast, fasting days twice a week instead of uh, once a year on the Day of Atonement. And of course they cheated because they would eat a big breakfast right before 6 a.m. and then they didn't eat again until 6 p.m. which really they were only missing one meal. But it made them look good and they wore special clothes and they made their faces look sad and painted their faces so that they looked dull and virtue signaled in that way. And the Lord Jesus Christ gives this parable about the bridegroom and fasting. He says this occasion is not a funeral. It's not a sad occasion. It's not time to fast. Why? Because all the Jews knew that when you celebrated a wedding, you were exempt and relieved from religious observances. You were allowed to rejoice and be happy and celebrate. And the Lord Jesus Christ says, this is why Levi is celebrating. They're giving him his go away party so that he can follow me. <clears throat> and he says the time's coming when they're going to fast in those days, when the bridegroom is taken away from them. And that's the first reference in the Gospel of Mark to the crucifixion. We talked about that. We talked about the patch on the old garment. The old garment was worn out and incompatible with the new patch, which was only a partial replacement to that old garment that was worthless. And it just made the old garment worse. So the, the idea is to discard the old and replace it with the new, which is, of course, what God did when he brought grace, salvation through grace, through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. This is something that is a progressive revelation and continues to be revealed throughout the Gospels and the book of Acts and then into Paul's ministry. Then the wine in the old wineskins. Now, this is not just a partial replacement, but this is entirely replacement. You're filling these old wine skins with completely filled with new wine. And what happens? It ruptures the old wine skin. Why? Because the law or the old way is incompatible with the new way, the way of grace. You, you can't mix the two. And of course, the book of Galatians is written about that, where people are trying to put the New Testament believers back under the law. The Bi and in that same book, the Bible says the law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So what was the purpose of the law? The purpose of the law was to show us God's absolute standard and what he expected us to live up to, a good goal. However, it proved that none of us could keep the law, except for Jesus, who came and kept it uh, and satisfied God the Father's requirements 
and died in our place. So the law is our schoolmaster, what? To bring us to Christ. Why? To show us our need that we are sinners and that we fall short of the glory of God and that we need grace. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. So then you had the new wine in the old wineskins. That didn't work either. So now the next controversy comes up. The last was about fasting. Why don't your disciples fast? And Jesus says, because they're celebrating. Are you going to make them not celebrate and be sad people like you? And that's exactly what they were. They were very sad people and uh, deplorable people. So now here comes Sabbath work and then Sabbath healing will be the next controversy. What about working on the Sabbath? Um, so it came to pass, verse 23, chapter 2, verse 23. And it came to pass that he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day, and his disciples began, as they went, to pluck the ears of corn. Now here comes the controversy over Sabbath work. Here the disciples are doing something that today in modern society would seem awfully strange and would be expressly forbidden under our laws. But in Israel, it was permissible to do. However, it was not permissible on the Sabbath day. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 23, verses 24 to 25, the Bible says, When thou comest into thy neighbor's vineyard, then thou mayest eat grapes thy fill at thine own pleasure, but thou shalt not put any in thy vessel. When thou comest into the standing corn of thy neighbor, then thou mayest pluck the ears with thine hand, but thou shalt not move a sickle into thy neighbor's standing corn. So it was permissible in Israel under the Jewish economy. And you remember, you have to keep in mind, God called Israel out to be a special people with special laws, to be a light to the rest of the world. And he did special things through the Jewish people, and he had a special theocracy, uh, things that may not be required in other governments. However, this was allowed. You could go, if you were a poor person, if you were a traveling person, then you could walk through, and this was their way of, of social help or assistance. We have our ways in America today, but they had their ways of supporting those in society that were poor or traveling. As they came through your cornfield, and it was an agricultural society, kind of different from today, but nonetheless, everybody, it was pretty much an agricultural society. They could help themselves to some of your food. They just couldn't put it in a container, uh, or they couldn't take tools and harvest it, but they could harvest it with their hands and uh, as they went. So it was permissible for a traveler to eat as he passed through a field, but it wasn't allowed to put a sickle or in a container. The problem here was that it was done on the Sabbath day. And by this time, the Sabbath day was not just another feast uh, or another day of rest. Now, thousands of petty rules and regulations had crept into the traditions and practices of the Jewish culture. For example, Sabbath observance. Um, for, let me give you an example. The Jews taught that you could spit on a rock. But if you spit, you could not spit on the soil. Why? Because if you spit on the soil, you're creating mud, which makes border and is a form of work. All right? So make sure when you spit, you spit on a rock because you're breaking the law if you don't hit that rock and hit the dirt. Uh, not only was all work forbidden, but it had been classified under 39 different heads, four of which were reaping winnowing, threshing, or preparing a meal. Technically, the disciples had broken all four of these rules. Now the Pharisees have, think they've got them. They've been watching. They're out there in the field. They're watching Jesus and his disciples out in the middle of nowhere, watching them. Why? They're trying to catch something that he's doing and try to label it as wrong. So, you know, and nothing is more serious to the Jew than breaking the Sabbath. In fact, it carried a penalty of death in their day. So, verse 24, And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? What are the Pharisees doing out in the cornfield? Look at verse 25. And he said unto them, Have ye never read what David did when he had need and was hungered, he and they that were with him? Now, the Lord Jesus Christ is asking them a question in response to their question, uh, asking it in such a way that an affirmative or expected answer <clears throat> should come. 
Haven't you ever read about David eating the showbread? Well, of course they have. They, they know the law backward and forward. They know it so well that they're able to accuse or try to accuse the Lord Jesus Christ of breaking the law. That's what, exactly what they're trying to do. They, they are experts on the law, as a matter of fact. That didn't make them spiritual, but it made them experts. Now, the Pharisee uh, knew about David and his men when they were fleeing from Saul and there was nothing to eat. So the priest gave them showbread to eat from the tabernacle, which was, it was special hallowed bread that was only permissible to be eaten by the priest. It was special holy bread, and there was a certain class, a priest class of people doing the service of the tabernacle, and it was their ministerial, um, what God had given them, okay? It was, it was theirs. It was theirs to have to sustain them in the ministry of the Lord. And so the Lord is justifying the actions of his disciples because they were hungry and was suggesting that it was no different than the situation of David. Him and his men, they were hungry and they were fleeing from Saul and, and, and <clears throat> David was God's anointed one. And they ate the showbread because the priest said, well, this is all we have, the hallowed bread. But it sustained David. Now, was it a good thing? Of course it was a good thing. Uh, they ate the bread from the holy place, even though it was lawful only for the priest to eat. Now, Jesus says, did you never, never read about that? What about that, huh? Well, are you going to accuse David? And uh, verse 25, 26, I mean, how he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar, the high priest, and did eat the showbread, which is not lawful to be eaten, but for the priests, and gave also to them which were with him. Question mark. Of course, they read that. He continues, they're silent. And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man, there's that term again, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Okay, so what was the Sabbath given for? Was it given to put a big burden on us and make life difficult, make us suffer under the heavy hand of God like some Pharaoh that's driving us like a uh, 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 hard taskmaster? No, the Sabbath was ordained to restore men. But when it became a burden and a hindrance, it was fulfilling a wrong intent. And that's what Jesus is getting to. The Lord Jesus is driving at this point. You folks have turned the Old Testament law into a bunch of petty rules and regulations and put a burden upon the backs of these people when that wasn't God's intent at all. God intended the law to be a curb, a, a guide, a, something to keep us on track, something to keep our attention, and something to illustrate to us certain things and show us our need of Jesus Christ. So he's showing that even the law was not unbendable. In the next chapter, another controversy comes up with the Sabbath. And uh, here again, he proclaims himself as the Son of Man. Not only does he proclaim himself as the Son of Man from Daniel chapter 7, who's going to come up and set his kingdom on earth, but the Lord of the Sabbath. He says he's, all, he's the Lord of the Sabbath, which is true. But that gives the Pharisees a false basis for framing the Lord Jesus Christ as the Gospel of Mark progresses, because they're going to have a problem with him being not only the Lord of the Sabbath, but also his claims and, and his not refusing to own the fact that he is deity. Chapter 3, and he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand. So here comes the controversy not only about Sabbath work, but Sabbath healing. Now Jesus is going to heal on the Sabbath day. Oh, heaven forbid. What a terrible thing to heal a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath day. And they watched him, verse 2. They're watching him. They got their eye on him. Whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him. So we are now at a critical point in the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you read the verse above carefully, you'll notice that the Pharisees had been out in the cornfield watching the Lord Jesus and his disciples. And what are they doing out there? They're watching him as he's crossing a grain field. Now he comes in, into a synagogue, and there they are, and they know the guy would be there. They know that this guy with a withered hand is going to be in the congregation. In fact, it's possible that he may have been planted there in order to set up the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And of course, they knew what Jesus would do, because what's Jesus going to do? Of course, he's going to heal the guy. He's going to have compassion on the guy. And uh, one, there's a lost gospel, and I don't believe these lost gospels are canonical, but they do have information in them that's interesting. It's interesting that there's a gospel of Hebrews that says that this man was a stonemason. Now, again, you know, I don't believe this is the word of God, but, you know, it could or could not be true. But the pro that he was a stonemason, mason, and could no longer support himself because his hand had withered up, and he did not want to beg. So it would be a good and a righteous thing for him to be healed. So the problem was that it was the Sabbath day. And to heal him, of course, would have been work, and the Jewish law forbade it. So uh, here's, here's some examples of things that could or could not be done on the Sabbath day. Uh, medical, for example, medical attention. If you go under them, read about the, you know, the, all the writings that the Jews had come up with uh, about healing or medical attention, not healing, but medical attention given on the Sabbath day. It could only be given if a life was in danger. For example, if a woman was um, in childbirth, she could be helped on the Sabbath day. Uh, an infliction of the throat might be treated. Or um, if a wall fell on somebody, uh, uh, well, enough of the wall could be cleared away to see if the guy was dead or not. If he was still alive, he could be helped. But if he was dead, the body had to be left there with all the wall on top of him until the next day. And then they would uncover the wall and bury the guy and so forth and so on. A fracture, if you had a fracture in your hand or your foot or something like that, it could not be attended to. Okay, So if this guy had had a fractured hand, they had come up with this law that you could not do any work or attend to this guy's fractured hand until the next day. Uh, cold water, though, could be poured on a hand or foot that was sprained to relieve the pain. A cut finger could be bandaged, but you couldn't put ointment on that finger. Okay, that, This is the kind of petty things that the Jews had come up with. The guiding principle was this. An injury could be kept from getting worse, but it must not be made better. Not on the Sabbath day. Now, that's difficult to grasp, I know, but a strict Jew wouldn't, wouldn't even defend his life on the Sabbath day. There are stories from Josephus that tells us of the wars in the, of the Maccabees. The Syrian soldiers deliberately pursued the Jews on the Sabbath, knowing that they would not fight back. They fled to caves, and when the Syrians set fire to the caves, the Jews wouldn't even stop up the entrances to the caves because it was the Sabbath when the Roman general Pompey was besieged Jerusalem, besieging Jerusalem, the Jews uh, took refuge in the temple precincts. Knowing the strict Sabbath beliefs of the Jews, Pompey built a huge mount on the Sabbath day where he could bombard them from above, and the Jews never lifted a finger to defend themselves or to stop the uh, building, although they knew what they were doing would sign their own death warrant. All right, so that's why the Romans exempted the Jews from military service, because they knew that a strict Jew would not fight on the Sabbath day. So the attitude concerning the Sabbath was unbending to the Jew. With that background on Jewish attitude toward the Sabbath, what happens here next is very interesting. Look at verse 3. And he said, he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, stand forth. So now Jesus is not going to hide what he's going to do. He's not going to apologize what he's doing. He says, stand out in the open. Let everybody see what's going to happen right here because I am not going to pull back on this thing that I'm going to do for this man. All right. Now he puts them on the spot with two simple questions. Look at verse 4. And he saith unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil? Now why does he say that? I'll come back to that. To do good or to do evil. Is Jesus doing evil? No. I'll come back to that. To save life or to kill? But they held their peace. Why? Because they knew he had put them on the spot one more time. Jesus, knowing their minds, uh, said something like, he's saying something like this. Now, you're concerned about the Sabbath, aren't you? Well, let me tell you something. Which one is closer to the, to, to the purpose or objective of a holy, righteous God on the Sabbath, yours or mine? I want to do good to this man who needs his hand healed, and you're thinking about killing me. He knew they were thinking about trying to kill him. I want to save this man and heal him, and you're thinking about killing me. Now, which one is in line with the Sabbath? Well, no wonder they were quiet, huh? If they answered, they would have to admit that it was lawful to, it was lawful to do good, and it was a good thing that he was about to do. Now, they, they answered that they would have to say that it was not lawful to do evil 
well, then if they had done that, well, they were then they were plotting to do evil, and they're they're guilty. They're more guilty than Jesus. All right, so he's got them slam dunked. Verse five, and when he looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand, and he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. Praise God, Amen. You say, brother Mayhem, do you believe that really happened? Yes, I believe that really happened, and I believe all those people saw it happen. And it was controversial, uh, as it always is. And did Jesus get angry? It says he looked about him with anger. Jesus got angry. You say, whoa, I, but I thought he was always holy and righteous and meek and lowly and nice and sweet. No, Jesus got angry. Amen. Uh, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Ephesians 4.26. There is a time to be angry as when you get out of control and when your righteous indignation turns into self-righteous sin, that's that's the problem. So they uh, immediately went out after that to plot with the Herodians to put him to death. Verse 6, And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. So uh, Jesus then has to withdraw himself in verse 7. That's where we'll pick up the next time. But to the Pharisees, keep in mind that religion was or, um, religion was ritual. It meant obeying certain rules and regulations in order to make yourself look good. The end did not justify the means. Jesus broke the strict regulations of their law, and they were genuinely convinced that he was a bad man. But you know what? He, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Amen. Their eyes were blinded and their hearts were hardened. Now, today we have the same type of thing. We have certain groups of people that say you've got to keep the Sabbath even though uh, the Bible tells us not to let anybody judge you in regard to the Sabbath days or various other religious observances. That's in the book of Galatians. <clears throat> and you find nobody observing the Sabbath um, that's a believer or at least um, coerced into or, or commanded to keep the Sabbath. But they kept the first day of the week. Why? Because Jesus rose on the first day of the week. Amen. In fact, nobody but a Jew under the Mosaic law is ever commanded to keep the Sabbath in the Word of God. All right. Anyway, the Lord is going to start moving out into the area of Galilee some more, into the desert places, and do some more ministry. But the, those are the various controversies uh, that come up that we've covered uh, regarding Jesus Christ by the uh, scribes and Pharisees. The, the healing of the paralytic, the eating with tax collectors and sinners and associating with Levi, over fasting, over Sabbath work, and over Sabbath healing. Now all these controversies have completed. The Lord Jesus Christ has put the scribes and Pharisees in their place, and now they are desperate to find some way to find fault with the Lord Jesus Christ and ultimately put him to death. The book of Mark is going to take a different direction from this point on as the Lord Jesus Christ continues and presses the rest of his ministry in before he goes to the cross. He's going to call his disciples in the next study. Um, so we'll see that as we go. And I hope that you'll return and um, study with us. We're all students of the Bible, me included. And I hope this study has helped you to understand the Bible in some way or some fresh way. Uh, maybe brought some things to remembrance for you that you already knew. Maybe you learned something new. Maybe it clarified the Word of God in your mind. Every time you study the Word of God, it fixes it better in your mind and heart. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. My email address and telephone number are given if you have questions. Uh, if you disagree with me, I welcome your disagreeing comments as well. And it was, if, if it was a blessing to you, feel free to share it with your friends. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and increase and bless your understanding of his word.